right, folks, I'm Rich Folley, and you're watching PBS Books coverage of the National Book Festival here in Washington, D.C., put on every year by the Library of Congress, this amazing event. And how cool is it right now? First time we've spoken to Marcus Zusak, who's the author of Bridge of Clay. And of course, everybody knows The Book Thief, a book that's changed so many lives. I'm sure you hear that all the time in your book signing lines. I just showed you today a friend of mine who's got a tattoo, and I'm probably, there's many others with tattoos of your stuff out there, too. But well, Bridge of Clay, you. it's good to Same, have you, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, Bridge of Clay, let's talk about it, though. It's been a long time. People who, who read The Book Thief, who fell in love with your writing, who fell in love with the story, have been waiting for the next Marcus Zusak for a long, long time. It took a while. Um, you went to work on this novel, how many years ago? 15 years ago, and maybe more. Yeah. And just started grinding out the next novel and weren't going to come out with anything until it was done. That was a journey in itself. Can you talk just about the process of the second book? Yeah. Oh, well, it's always, sometimes it's easier to start at the end. And uh, even my one of my favorite stories about this book was uh, just sitting at, uh, in the kitchen. I like working in the kitchen and I like working in the morning. And my daughter was sitting opposite me eating cereal, you know, and I said to her, I don't know about about you and other people out there, but um, my children eat like barbarians, you know? <laughs> yeah. I said to her, can you just keep it down over there? I'm trying to get some work done here. And I was doing the last edits and, uh, and she said, she just looked at me and she stopped and she's gone, you work. <laughs> <laughs> and, she didn't know what that meant. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and so I actually thought about that all day and I, I thought, I added up. I, I, for the first time, I counted how many words there were in that book. And it's 128,000 words, and I divided that by how many days there are in 13 years, and it came out as 1.9 words per day, you know. And and so I thought she's probably got a Why point. Why did you do that to yourself, Marcus? Uh, it was That's just brutal. I mean, just to like do the math. Uh, I That's know. That's painful. 1.9. No, you should have done that. <laughs> but it's also, of course, the words you never see. That's you right. know, That are so important to a book. And uh, but I think the reason it took so long was. You know, I just think, you know, you realize as a writer at some point, there are already enough books in the world sometimes. And you think, if I want to put another one out, I want it to be the right book. And, and I think it took so long because it was a bit like I was writing for the world championship of myself, you know, right. writing this book. I, you know, I wanted to write better than I actually am. And, and I think it was finally just taking that pressure away a little bit that just said, just write it because you love it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how I got it done in the end. You wrote something in, your, um, in the end of the book in your acknowledgments that said that you talked to people about um, what life would have been like if you hadn't finished the book and that there were friends to, that, wanted, that reminded you. So clearly during that, those 13 years, there were moments when you may have hit self-doubt or wasn't sure if this was going to be something you're going to be able to finish and that others rallied you to, to keep working at it because imagine if you didn't finish it. Yeah, well, that's actually um, directed straight to my wife. She's the, uh, she's the unsung hero of this book. And she actually made me quit it at the 10-year mark. And uh, she just, again, in the kitchen, all the best stories happen in the kitchen. She said, uh, she said you know, it's been 10 years. I'm giving you one week. <laughs> and it, it wasn't one week to finish. It was just one week to get happy again writing yeah. the book. And, and sort of to find you know, just to remind me of the joy that I actually have writing. And that week came and went like all the rest. So I did quit the book and it made me realize uh, just, you know, it's the old cliche that you don't know what you've got until it's taken away from you. And, uh, and so when I came back to it, I, I sort of realized that I loved the struggle of it as well. And, uh, and then I finished it by the end of the year. Yeah, it's an amazing story. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ambitious novel. It's five Dunbar brothers living in, I think, Australia. I don't mm -hmm. think you ever identified the city yeah. you live in, I'm assuming, but I don't know. And this family that's basically left on their own after the mother, Penelope, mm -hmm. dies of cancer mm -hmm. and the father decides to leave the family, leaving the family up to the oldest and others. And it just becomes this, I think you said, a mix of barnyard and locker room or something in yeah. that house. And it becomes this, this world. And then the father decides to come back in. And the story then starts to revolve around Clay. And mm -hmm. that's where the, the story of Clay comes in. To know the five brothers and to tell the story, because you, you explore all the brothers. You go yeah. down those paths. We learn a lot about each of the brothers. And in fact, other characters too. But Clay, when did he rise up to be the, the character that you really wanted to focus on? Oh, it's funny that the, the original idea came from just walking around the suburb where I grew up as a kid 
and I thought of this boy who was building a bridge and he wanted it to be beautiful and perfect and his one moment of greatness. And uh, that was early on. That was when I was 20 years old. And I think then all the brothers and the lives of Penelope and Michael, their parents, came into the book. And I, I started realising, I think you realise towards the end of your book what it's actually about. And I think this book is about the idea that what we're made of is stories and we start becoming who we are long before we're even born. Yeah. And I think Clay is the, char the character who is understanding of that. And he's the one who loves his parents' stories. And the story of, you know, their father leaving them, there's so much more to that story. And Clay is the only brother who knows that story. And uh, so it's, I wanted, I just like the idea too with this book that we don't need to know everything straight away all the time. You know, we live in a world now where you have to, we, we have to know everything straight away. But this is a book that I guess reveals itself quite slowly. And Clay Oh my God, is that. that's so true about this book. You don't, there were times when you would drop hints about what's happening and it would be 50, 100 pages before you would tell me what that was. And I might've even sort of forgotten that you dropped that yeah, hint yeah. earlier. And then you drop it on me 100 pages later. And I was like, wow there was a reason that you did that earlier. And that was a, that, so that was a purposeful device for you then. Yeah, well, there's one that's 300 pages later. Yeah, you leave us wanting. <laughs> one, when, when Clay leaves to build the bridge and he, he picks up little tokens to remind himself of his brothers. And one of them is the Monopoly iron, uh, you know, the iron token right. from Monopoly. And, uh, and you wonder why he takes that. And then it's actually his symbol of Rory, the second oldest Dunbar boy. And it's just a reminder of the night where they were all playing Monopoly in the kitchen, sweating like merchants and swindlers. And, uh, and it's a moment where Rory, the, uh, his brother, who's the really rough and tough one, you know, he's known as the sort of, he's the, the undefeatable brother, you yeah. know. And, but he, it's the night that he cracks, right. you know. And he, he's emotional he, about the yeah, mother. Yeah, and he says, when they know their mum's going to die, and, uh, you know, and he just stops and he says, how, we, how the hell are we going to live without her, you know. And, and I think the thing that made me want to be a writer, and I'm sort of, because it's funny even talking about that now, I feel a bit emo get, getting a bit emotional, is that I love the idea that when I was 16 and I was reading books and suddenly I understood that it was just such a, a magical thing that this was all made up, but I was believing it when I was in it. Yeah, you were and in that story. So that, for that, that 13 years, it must have been also a little bit of a solace to go back into those characters and to revisit them and to push their story. I know that like, you're probably saying, no, it's pain. <laughs> <laughs> no, it but was, like to, be, no, to revisit them. It is, uh, no, it's both. It's both a solace and a menace. And uh, cause it was the thing that was dogging me all the time. But the thing that I, I really loved, well, two things. One is that no matter how bad it gets and how long it takes, I always am somehow weirdly optimistic that I can actually do it. Now, I, I just have the most terrible week, terrible month, terrible year, <laughs> terrible decade, and I still think, I can still get it done. Yeah. I can get it done. I'm going to have a, a good, good patch here. And, uh, well, and that's why the book thief happened. That's why this book happened. I uh, mean, yeah, it's I not mean, like the book thief was without its struggles as well. Yeah. You know, um, I think, and that's always, I think, the line you're treading as a writer is you're skeptical of yourself but it's getting through that. And so rather than having moments of self-doubt, I, I actually have moments of belief, yeah. <laughs> you know, where belief actually shines through the self-doubt. Well, also as a writer, I mean, when you talk about your daughter asking, you know, your dad doesn't work, but the fact is with writers, so much of that writing is in the subconscious. Like literally you're chewing through your characters and the, the, the novel and the story and the structure in the shower, while you sleep, while you're driving, while you're doing anything, while you're walking, you know, mm. your children in, a, in a, whatever. Like that is just sort of how a writer's mind seems to work. There's work happening yeah. all the time. You, you're living in a, with a world inside your head. Well, it's, it's what I basically describe it as that I live in two worlds. And the, there's, there's the, the real world, obviously, and there's the world of the book I'm writing. And I know that it's working well when I feel like I wake up in the morning and I can roll out of bed and land in that world yeah. rather than have to traverse great, you know, rivers and roads and, you know, deserts to sort of bang on the door of that world and try to scratch my way back in. 
you always want to feel like that world is close to you. And, uh, and that's why, you know, you know, it's, I never take it for granted. I never, and I never expect it to be easy, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, you always want to write a better book than your last one, you know, so that's what I'm always aiming for. Yeah. So th th they, they call the book Thief Young Adult and they call Bridge of Clay, but like literally your book has been read by people of all ages um, and it is just as impactful to people of really any age. And, and I feel like with Bridge of Clay, it, it's a mature book. I mean, you're asking the readers, like to your point, mm. I'm going to drop you some clues. You're going to follow along and 100 pages mm. later, I'm going to tell you a little bit more yeah. about what that meant. It's a like mature readers kind of understand that concept yeah. of following along. It's, it's not a kid's book. No, it, you know? it, I think it's, I mean, I noticed that when I go and speak anywhere in the world really is that I have a few sort of precocious 10 or 11 year olds in the audience. And then from there I have a lot of, then I do have a lot of teenagers and then I have a lot of people in their twenties and thirty, all, and then all the way up to seventies and eighties. So what I've, now I, I've just learned to really, I mean, not that I ever held to them that tightly anyway, but just to let go of those sort of boundaries and, and categorization. Right. I just think of, I try to write a book that someone might love uh, once they get to know it or once they really start to understand it. And I think of my favorite books, they're just, I just say, oh, I love that book. You know, and you said about Wonder just now, oh, I love that book and I love her and, and, uh, and I think you didn't say, oh, I love that children's book. Right, no. <laughs> you know, you, a it loved felt very book, adult to me. A, yeah, a loved book transcends the category it comes from. And, and I guess that's what I'm trying to do. And that feels like the better ambition to always have. Yeah. Let's, I want to talk about Clay just a little bit more. We don't have a ton of time, but I, Clay, you said to, to build that one perfect thing, you know, that bridge. His dad comes back, Michael comes back and asks the family to help him build this bridge, you know, basically from scratch. Clay takes the, up the challenge. He's the only child that does. And it's a, an obsession of sorts. And one of the things you read into Clay's character is this sort of obsessive quality of building the perfect thing. And mm -hmm. like, I actually thought of the bridge over the river Kwai, which is this yeah. like classic yeah, bridge yeah. building. It's got to be perfect. But, but Clay felt that way to me. And I'm wondering, when you were writing Clay, that obsession with perfection of making something the best it can possibly be, really taking the time, Yeah. did, did you channel some of that as you're writing the book yourself? I think it was one of the real challenges of the book because I was writing about a character in pursuit of perfection. And so you feel like you've got to be in that same pursuit as well. And, uh, and it was something that, I mean, I guess the whole idea with Clay and the, the whole idea of using Michelangelo and the statue of David, but then using the unfinished statues uh, or sculptures of the slaves as a sort of motif as well was the idea that the only way to really achieve greatness is to understand that you can't, yeah. but trying anyway. And that's actually what's great. And, uh, and so I was mindful of that in the writing and Clay sort of understands that as well. And it's why he can build the bridge, but he might not necessarily be given the miracle he's looking for. Yeah. Someone else will might get that. Might not appreciate it as much. Yeah. Have you been able to appreciate the book tour and going out and interacting with fans about a new book? Has that felt like a relief fun, you know, like fresh? What's it been like for you? I think it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, because it, it's been nine months or so now since the book came out. And it's all, it, on one hand, it's been quite difficult. And I think it's really important to be honest about these things because it's not the book thief. It's not going it, to, you know, the book thief has that sort of really whimsical sort of quality to it as well and it and it's a book that's just for whatever reason had magic dust sprinkled over it you know it, it's a lucky book and I, bridge I of clay is this, it's pretty it, magic it's, you're right uh, it's its own bridge of clay is its own thing and and uh, and and i think because of the challenges it does set readers you know some some people of course sort of it's not the book for them you know or it's not the book for them right now and uh, and that's something i learned in high school as well i mean with a book like, and I'm not comparing, you know, to the greatness of a book like Catch-22, but I was at least exposed to that book, you know, and I came back later and read it and loved it. So, um, but for me, speaking to my readers and uh, getting to come to days like this, it's not even work. You know, it's a privilege. I, I just have loads of fun and I love, you know, just hearing everybody else's stories as well. And uh, and it's, it's a really beautiful thing. I mean, I, I could be doing all sorts of, hard labor so this is just uh just special and i'm grateful to it i uh 
you know, my readers owe me nothing, you know, and I, I owe them everything. Well, I will say that while you, your daughter was chomping and making all that noise eating, you were quietly influencing, even those days at the kitchen table, a generation of readers and people who grew up on the book thief, who's changed their lives and who are anxiously awaiting this one, and you've delivered now. And it's cool to see you back out talking yeah. about it again. And it's really great that you could join us on our set too. So. It is. It's great to be here, and thanks for being so generous. Oh Rich. yeah, thank great. you, Marcus. Great no, to have thank you. Thank you so much. No, Appreciate absolute it. pleasure.